Well, uh, my name is Tara Harris, and I'm Vice President for Conservation here at the Minnesota Zoo. And I'm happy to spend the evening with all of you. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment for helping make this event free for all of us. So let's give them a hand. And we'd also like to thank our media sponsor, Min Post. Please be sure to check out their Earth Journal blog, which covers environmental issues in the news with a special emphasis on solutions to environmental challenges. And also, if you have missed one of our previous speakers, uh, you can go to our website and there are recordings there for most of our speakers. So please be sure to check that out. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening, uh, Jeff Montefiering. Uh, Jeff has been a conservation biologist here at the Minnesota Zoo since 2009, though he has been involved with the zoo for much longer. But I'm not going to steal all of his great stories. He's going to share that with you, how he came to be involved with the zoo. Uh, but I did want to at least say that um, Jeff has a master's degree in conservation biology from the University of Cape Town, and he's currently pursuing his PhD at Stellenbosch University. And, um, Jeff has spent about 13 years living and working in Namibia, and I've had the pleasure of being able to spend some time uh, with him over there, and I just have to say that it is the most incredible place I have ever been, and I'm just so proud of the work that Jeff is doing over there to save the black rhino. So please welcome Jeff Montefiering. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tara. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. We are a nice, cozy group tonight. So um, I think we can even answer some questions during the talk. If you guys have some, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and, and I will go through. But um, as Tara said, my name is Jeff Montefering. Uh, I've lived in Namibia, Southwest Africa, for 13 years, but I still do call Minnesota my home, uh, mainly just to make my mother happy. Um, but uh, it's always great to come back to Minnesota uh, every year um, and share our story uh, with Namibia um, and to you know, try and garner some more support for our work. So tonight I just had a couple of objectives that I really wanted to try and get through. Uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce to you guys all the, the myriad of different strategies that have been tried and tested for, uh, for rhinos in Africa. And I think you'll, you'll see um, how complex the issue is um, and how many different kinds of interesting strategies are currently being trusted, uh, tested, some with varying degrees of success. And then I want to spend some time focusing on um, what we are promoting in, in Namibia, uh, particularly with our conservancy rangers and the work to involve communities in our fight to combat poaching. Um, and then I just want to end uh, with a little bit of, of, of parallels with some of the policing issues that uh, we're also dealing with here in the U.S. So as always, I have a lot to say, so I want to get going here. And when I usually talk, I, I often, or when I come back to, the, to Minnesota, I often get asked, you know, how in the heck does a guy who grew up in Minnesota, a small town, went to play football at St. John's, end up on a donkey uh, in Namibia? Um, it's a very good question. So I went to school to play football at St. John's. Um, there's no St. Thomas people in the crowd tonight, right? You got lucky. <laughs> St. Thomas beat St. John's as last week. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to be on the first study abroad program uh, in, in South Africa back in 1997 at St. John's. And that trip, I think, really, really had a huge impact on not only my life, but obviously my career. I was able to see this whole new world open up um, and, of course, fell in love with Africa. And when I came back from, from um, that study abroad program, I was able to change a lot of my courses and focus on conservation. And as soon as I was done, graduated with a BA in biology, I was very excited because I had a very hopeful job interview down here at the Minnesota Zoo and I was working with the bird program. Some of you might know Dave Cruz there, good looking guy. Um, and he told me, Jeff, you're in, man. This is, a, this is a perfect, perfect job for you. So I went in, did the interview, was shortlisted, but a week later got the, uh, the dear job letter. Sorry, Jeff, you did not make it. Um, 
But I still wanted to work uh, or somehow be connected with the zoo. And I grew up coming down here uh, every summer with my mom. She would take us down here. I remember the beluga whales, the tigers, of course. Um, and I was still able to volunteer with an international organization that's based actually in the basement of our building now, the conservation department, called the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group. And they have an incredible network of international experts that they work with all around the world on all kinds of different species conservation programs. Um, and through that, I was able to meet a very interesting lady, also an ex uh from the U.S., but she had moved to this country called Namibia um, to help save cheetahs. And I had done some work um, on a wolf project previously up in northern Minnesota, and I had done a whole bunch of different kinds of, of research work. Um, and one of the things that I did do was study feeding habits. Um, now, when I was sort of doing a, a quick interview with Lori about coming to Namibia, I sort of tried not to maybe mention that I have some experience working with poop, but as soon as I mentioned it, her eyes got very big, and my invitation to Namibia actually was a box of cheetah poop that she had sent to me from a colleague out on the west coast, and I was meant to now bring this thing back to Namibia, analyze for her, and well, you know, beggars can't be choosers, so... I gratefully accepted and found myself on a, on a plane in, in uh, December 1999 to Namibia for the first time. Now, let me take you back just a few months because um, I hope everyone, or most people know what that is. That's the mystery machine from Scooby-Doo, but that was also my college van. And little did I know that that mystery machine would lead me to meet this great man. Now some of you might have known the late Dr. Ron Tilson, Director of Conservation here at the zoo for many, many years, renowned international tiger expert. And when he saw that van parked out in the zoo parking lot while I was volunteering, he told his wife, Janet, that she had to find out who was driving this mystery machine. I didn't know who Ron was at the time, but after my first meeting with Ron, I knew I was very lucky to have somehow left a very interesting impression on Ron, and he said, you know what, Jeff, someday um, I'd like to get you to come work at the zoo, help me with some tigers and maybe something else. So over the years, I started working with Ron um, in South China, looking for tigers. Maybe some of you are familiar with that program, uh, starting in about 2000, 2001. So I was kind of going between Namibia and China at the time. But during this process, I also happened to meet a beautiful young lady in Namibia who happened to become my wife. And of course, those things help kind of seal the deal and keep you in a country. Um, but in 2009, um, I was offered my dream job again, working with Dr. Tilson. Um, part of his succession plan was to create a position at the zoo that would require that person not to actually be based at the zoo, be outside of the zoo doing um, field conservation as a new trend in zoos to show more direct support for saving wildlife in the wild, in, in nature. So I was the guinea pig, uh, and I'm very, very grateful for that fact. Um, and it sort of made a full circle of the Minnesota Zoo, um, keeping me connected to Minnesota, but also keeping me in Namibia. And um, this is where I ended up spending almost all of my time uh, for the past 13 years. This is my home. This is a place called World's End, I'm not lying. <laughs> and if you can see from the photo, uh, it's probably not far off. This was actually an old farm back in the 50s. It's about 50 or 60 miles away from the ocean, but right out on the gravel plains in northwestern Namibia. And all of our uh, research work, uh, or my research work anyway, is conducted from, from this one small oasis in the middle of the desert. And what's not to love about Namibia, as Tara mentioned, it's just a fantastic place. Um, Imagine a place about half the size of the state of Minnesota with basically one fence um, which has holes all over in it, a few dirt gravel roads, and a population about the size of St. Cloud, 65 to 80,000, or I'm from just outside of there. So um, this is a massive wilderness area, one of the last true wild landscapes uh, left in Africa, um, if not the world. Really beautiful. This is the famous Skeleton Coast, some of you might know or have heard of. The uh, coastline running all the way from the border with Angola, uh, pretty much all the way through uh, the country of Namibia. This is me on a hike crossing the dunes on the way to the sea. Um, really just a forbidden landscape. We do a lot of work with some very, very interesting um, indigenous tribes. This, these are called the Himba people. 
who still retain a lot of their, pretty much all of their old traditional um, culture, uh, their dress code, way they live, the way they, they eat. And these people have managed to work a, a, a livelihood uh, in and amongst all the wildlife, including lions, rhinos, elephants, and of course that is what also has made me fall in love with Namibia. This is a famous desert elephant. Lots of your iconic predators from Africa, lions, cheetahs, hyenas, and then of course the black rhino. And these are not just the normal black rhino. This is actually, in northwestern Namibia, the last truly wild population of any rhino left in the world. Uh, about 180, 190 rhinos roam this, uh, this desert wilderness. And that is really what attracted me and um, grabbed my attention. And it wasn't only seeing this amazing prehistoric creature out in this primal landscape, you know, that basically looks like Mars, but it was the conservation challenge um, of the time as well. And some of you may have heard the story of the black rhino is one of the most catastrophic of any endangered species um, decline stories uh, in the world, where about 95% of the world's black rhino were wiped out over just a 20-25 year period. Um, you can see on the map there, um, the area in yellow here is the historic range from about 1950. And basically those teeny little red dots are all that is left. Um, and this is sort of our area up in northwestern Namibia. Now, what was sort of driving that uh, population decline? Poaching, for the most part. Um, and basically poaching just for the rhino's horn. In the past, what was, um, the, the poaching was actually driven by the use for the horns in traditional Chinese medicine. And they used um, the ground-up horn for all sorts of different things. And I just took sort of a little clip from one of the old ancient Chinese um, uh, books, and you can see all the very interesting things, removing hallucinogens, um, I like this one, the antidote to the evil miasma of hill streams. No idea what that means, but um, I'm sure it's important to some people. Um, but interestingly enough, a few years ago, the traditional Chinese community has come together now and has stood up actually for the protection of endangered species and have said that they no longer are going to support the use of these products in their medicine. Um, and this is a, a really great positive trend for, um, to try and reduce and combat poaching. However, we have a new threat, and this is the use of things like rhino horn, tiger bone, uh, elephant, ivory as a symbol of wealth. And with the growing elite class in, in Asia, particularly in China and Vietnam, um, this is a, a huge worry for us. Just to show you an example of the poaching trends uh, over the past 15 years or so, um, you can see, this is now just South Africa alone, and you can see between 2000 and 2007, sort of the poaching numbers were, were quite low. Uh, now, this is also considering South Africa has about 95% of the world's rhinos, roughly 20, 25,000 of them, so um, well, well below uh, breeding rates uh, for rhinos. But in 2007, we noticed something happened, and, and poaching rates shot up tremendously. Some people think that this was actually linked to a senior government official in Vietnam potentially being cured uh, of cancer from rhino horn and, and sort of spread uh, in, the, in the public media, but we're not exactly sure. It was sort of a fuzzy story. But since 2009, you can see things got completely out of hand. Uh, where last year, 1,215 rhinos were poached in South Africa alone. The vast majority of these rhinos were in Kruger National Park, um, heavily protected area. And basically three rhinos a day are currently, still today, being slaughtered uh, to feed the, the black market demand uh, for their use in horns. It's gotten so crazy. Uh, maybe some of you have, have seen this picture here. This is, this is a museum rhino from, from England uh, where somebody broke in and cut off the horn. This kid's trying to figure out what happened. Uh, there's, in the news, there's talk of terrorists, terrorist group in Central and East Africa who are driving a lot of the trade as well to help fund their activities. And President Obama, in fact, has now stood up and actually called illegal wildlife trade, um, in fact, linked to, to active terrorism. So um, there's definitely some good things about um, getting more interest in money, but with rhino horn going for ten to $20,000 a pound currently on the black market, it's a very, very challenging uh, task to handle. With, with the rhino horn weighing on average about 12 to 15 pounds, you're looking at about a quarter million dollars for a month. 
So, um, what do we do? This is a pretty big problem. We look at where most of the rhinos are in Africa. Um, there's a lot of poverty, a lot of poor people, um, easy pickings, corrupt officials. This is, this is a major, major challenge that we're sitting with. To deal with this, one of the first strategies that was tried was to try and stop the trade. Um, in 1977, so roughly 30 some years ago, almost 40 years ago, um, an institution called CITES was started. Now CITES stands for Convention on, of International Trade and Endangered Species. And it was, it's basically a consortium of, of, of sovereign nations that have come together and have tried to make a stand against um, the, trading, the trade in endangered species and to try and outlaw it. So um, this was one of the first activities in 1977. As you can see from some of the previous slides, the ban in itself has probably not worked very well. Uh, but the idea is very simple. You make it essentially illegal to trade um, in the use of a part, and hopefully you would uh, combat uh, the poaching. About 10 years later, another strategy took shape, and this is called um, dehorning. And again, it was fairly simple. It was, well, let's try cutting off the horn or the incentive that the poachers uh, want to take. Um, you can cut off the horn. The horn is basically fingernail. Um, and veterinarians discovered that um, basically there's a, a small little bulb that sits on top of the rhino's nose. And as long as you don't cut that off, you can remove the horn with very little um, impact on the rhino. You still have to obviously uh, put the rhino down. Um, which is always a risk, but um, this, was, this was sort of the idea. It was tried at first actually in Namibia in 1989, and it was actually uh, met with some success. Poaching rates did decline for a bit, but more recently some of the evidence that, that has come from um, dehorning activities has not been so positive. Uh, for example, to really um, allow this strategy to be effective, you have to let everybody know. You have to let everyone know that the rhinos in this area are dehorned. Don't come in here and waste your time, basically. So you might just be moving the problem somewhere else. Again, not really solving it, but just shifting it. The other problem that has been documented is that when you're, when you're a poacher and you're going in to do the dirty work, um, you do have to track that rhino. You have to follow it. It's not a comfortable job, not a comfortable task. And when you do find the rhino, and it's, it's got its horn cut off, you don't want to follow that rhino again. So what do you do? You shoot it. Um, so this has also been documented uh, multiple times. And currently with the price per weight as what it is, which currently is worth more than gold and cocaine, even a tiny little stub that sits on the top of the nose there is worth quite a bit of money. So the past two or three rhinos that we've also lost in Namibia have both been dehorned but they've still been poached. So, mixed results here with this one. Technology, I think, is always attractive as possible ways to combat some of these complex problems. Um, I've lost track of how many people who've asked me to, for an invitation to come to Namibia and fly drones. Um, it's sort of the new thing, I guess. <laughs> a few years ago, we got approached by Google, actually, to uh, come and, and prototype some new drones with you know, high infrared cameras and everything flying over the parks. Um, I don't think it ever did uh, manage to take off, but um, we've had a couple of local people also developing drones. There's been some success in South Africa in small game farms where they've actually created algorithms with the drones that would fly in, in paths where there might be a, a greater uh, chance of finding poachers. And um, according to some of those reports, it has been uh, remotely effective. But, uh, drones are, are quite expensive and they're not that easy to fly, most of them. So there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, so it's sort of a trade-off between how much it costs and how much it takes to learn and the actual outcomes. One of the more recent um, uh, technology developments, which is rather interesting, is, is cloning and even 3D printing. There's a big proposal out now for a company to 3D print millions of rhino horns and try and flood the market uh, over in China. Um, Again, in, in simple thought, it sort of makes sense if you're looking at very basic economic models. Um, but you know, it's a pretty risky idea. And I'm not sure where the Chinese or the trade partners actually sit on this. I mean, currently and, and technically, it's, it's actually 
illegal to even trade in rhino horn in, in China. So they would have to change uh, their domestic laws, would have to change the, uh, uh, the international laws. And again, evidence does show that A, there's already a lot of fake horns in the market, which obviously isn't doing much to stem the, the demand. And by opening up trade, again, you're creating this message that, that it's okay to, to use rhino horn and that they're effective. So again, it's sort of a mixed message thing. One of my favorite recent ones is uh, from actually an old buddy of mine here from the UK named uh, Dr. Paul O'Donoghue. And he has created a rhino cam. <laughs> and the rhino cam sits in the back corner of a rhino, and it actually runs using CCTV real-time video footage that is streamed live back at a command center. So people can actually watch what the rhino is seeing, and the idea is, is very simple, um, that it would you know, basically detect the poacher, film the whole thing, and the poacher would be caught red-handed. And I love this video, I've, I've got a little video clip here I want to show um, that, that Paul put together for BBC, which uh, you know, he introduces this idea. Um, Right, so, so, you know, I think as, as the, the issues become greater and greater, you know, hopefully we'll see more technology be developed that, that can be used. I think, you know, something like this is in its infancy, but I think it does have a lot of potential. Uh, maybe not for every rhino population, but certainly uh, for some, and some of the offshoots, uh, particularly understanding rhino habitats, their behavior, there might also be some great uh, additions from that too. So, uh, moving on to some of the other um, strategies, uh, poisoning rhino horns, uh, this has been tried now in South Africa where they literally uh, ingest uh, strictine or cyanide in the, the rhino horns. Again, it doesn't uh, damage or, or, or negatively impact on the rhino, but the idea is that the, the poison could then be ingested by somebody in Asia or a consumer and, and act as a, as a deterrent. Now, I hope everyone can sort of see some of the problems in this approach. Um, but some of the, the other issues is I think they're battling, too, with trying to get the poison to um, remain for any extended um, amount of time. Uh, but either way, the rhino is probably going to be poached, well, would have to be poached anyway, and dealing with the ethics of potentially murdering somebody is probably not that great of an idea. But it is being tried and tested. We've probably all heard of this guy, Corey Knowlton, um, from, from Dallas. Uh, trophy hunting um, certainly has been utilized across Africa, across the world as a conservation tool. Um, again, we're basically looking at, on the one hand, everybody I think agrees that rhino conservation and most conservation is very expensive. We don't have enough money to do it. And the proponents of, of trophy hunting will argue that this is a way to bring in much needed money um, to support the cause. Some of the, the, the opponents will argue, well, often that money doesn't get to where it should get, um, and it just doesn't make sense to kill an animal uh, for conservation. And it's, it's sort of this, this morals and, and money argument that currently is, is, is driving the, the debate. And I, I think the debate is, is good and healthy, um, but one of the things um, that is a little bit disappointing is that um, while all of this is happening, and I'm sure some of you maybe have seen some of the blog posts, I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of, of postings about uh, the trophy hunting issue. Um, the reality is three rhinos are still being killed every day in Africa. Um, and I think we do need to step back and look at the bigger picture at some point and, and ask ourselves, are we actually fighting the right fight? But um, on the other side, um, We've got a huge debate now around legalizing the trade. Uh, this has actually been promoted by some leading scientists. This was uh, a, a, a paper published in the journal Science, one of the, the top scientific journals in the world, um, putting out the economic argument for why legalizing the trade would help reduce the poaching. Um, it's been questioned and um, fought by other leading economists saying that Actually, the economics of rhino poaching is very different. It's not a standard normal commodity, therefore it does not apply to all those different models. But again, it's also questioning or it would be putting into the, the aid, uh, Asia this idea that it's okay to use rhino horn. Or actually, you know, please buy it because we will 
reinvest the money into rhino conservation and it will actually be good for rhinos. So again, it begs the question, first of all, can they regulate the trade without illegally uh, or illegal rhino horns entering into the market, which has been already documented with, with ivory? Um, and can the money generated from this find its way back to Africa to help support conservation? Big questions, um, you know, big unknowns, and a very risky uh, situation. On the flip side of legalizing the trade is what we call demand reduction. And this is where um, organizations work very hard in the end user or the consumer countries to try and basically stop the buying. Um, and most of the focus has been in China and Vietnam for, uh, for rhino horn, I'm focusing mostly on rhino now. Um, and a handful of organizations have been doing a lot of great work uh, to try and get the message out and to try and essentially stop the buying. So it's uh, basically being led by these three guys, probably recognize them, Yao Ming, Prince William, and Mr. Beckham. Um, one of the approaches a lot of these organizations use is celebrities to try and get the message across, just because people um, you know, make that connection and, 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 and things sort of resonate better. So I've just got a couple little clips that I wanted to show you from an organization called Wild Aid which um, I think you'll find quite interesting and they, uh, they play these clips quite wildly across social media and um, they have had uh, a bit of an impact. So, sort of a little humor there at the end. Uh, th this next one is a little bit more uh, kind of in your face, a little bit more reality, um, uh, but it again addresses the same sort of issue and speaks more about the, the, uh, the status symbol problem. You can see sort of the range in messaging that, that these guys try and put out there. Uh, so the question is, has it been successful? And there's been some very recent um, surveys that have been done that I think have been demonstrating um, some really positive trends. Um, this is a, a survey that was done in, in China by Wild Aid, the company that put together the previous, um, the previous couple of slides. Um, and you can see uh, there's been almost a 25% reduction um, in the belief that rhino horn is actually medicine. So this is conducted now across three of the biggest cities in China. 95% um, of Chinese that do not consume rhino horn believe that the government should be more strict. And 87% um, that actually do consume or said they consume rhino horn actually believe that the government should be more strict on regulating the trade. And 90% of the Chinese um, that were exposed to the messaging would not buy rhino horn. So these are just a few indicators that some of this, <coughs> some of this demand reduction is working. These are some of the results in Vietnam, which has also now recently become a main uh, consumer country. And you can see the number of, of rhino horn consumers has dropped significantly since they started doing some outreach, up to 77% in Hanoi, uh, the capital, which was sort of uh, found out to be the hot spot. And again, 25% increase. Um, in the Vietnamese that believe that it is medicine, but 38% still believes that it may cure cancer. And I would be willing to bet this might have to do with, again, the Vietnamese official that had reported that he was cured by cancer. Um, so that's sort of some of the, uh, the demand reduction, but you can see how some of this stuff can conflict with, with uh, strategies like legalizing the trade. Now, what are you going to, to tell all these people that you've been working with? For, for many years. Um, but one of the, the probably most dominant strategies across all of Africa is uh, military style law enforcement. Um, and it's, it's a very um, diverse strategy, mainly involves uh, army, heavily armed military um, officials going in and patrolling, uh, helicopters coming in with, with SEAL teams. Um, they've got uh, Attack dogs, they call them, that go out um, and, and literally hunt for people. Um, I like to call it sort of the, the Rambo approach. Um, and if you if you Google anti-poaching rhinos, um, you will find all sorts of great headlines about the war against the poachers. And and I think a lot of this stuff sort of drums up this this um, this idea that you've got to fight fire with fire. You've got to go and attack these poachers. But these military-style approaches have sort of reinforced or continue to reinforce what, what in conservation is known as, as fortress conservation. And it's this idea that sort of originated in 
pre-independence back in the, in the 1940s, 1950s, and sort of continued through the 80s, even as a, as a very current conservation paradigm, where to protect anything, you had to put a fence up, you had to chuck out all the people, and you basically had to protect everything in that fence um, with guns and, and the army. And what this did was really, was really create this alienation and these barriers with local people that actually live amongst the wildlife and have lived amongst them for many, many years. Because often the, the army and the people that are patrolling sort of see the local people as actually part of the problem. And even in South Africa now, they're, they're, I think last year they, they had uh, caught and arrested over 300 people coming in trying to poach rhinos, and they actually shot a handful of, of, of poachers as well. They have a shoot on site policy. Um, but the only trend that seems to be happening in addition to more and more army uh, personnel in protected areas, more and more helicopters, is more and more rhinos seem to be getting poached. Uh, so we've got to keep trying. So with all these different strategies out there, uh, it's actually very complicated as a conservationist uh, to try and figure out what do we use? Everyone talks about the silver bullet. Well, that one doesn't work. Well, that one doesn't work. Well, that one doesn't work. Or this one kind of works. And it's a very difficult thing to deal with, um, you know, this myriad of, of different strategies and solutions. But what I want to talk about now is, is sort of our approach in Namibia, um, and which orig originated a long time ago, actually, 35 years ago, um, and really went against the conventional thinking. So. Um, this is just a map showing sort of where we are sitting relative to Namibia. It is about a two-day airplane flight, so um, it is far. Um, but the one thing that struck me when I first moved to Namibia was that I think the, one of the differences is that rather than focus on solutions, a lot of people thought more deeply about the problem. And I think it's, it's easy to want to jump to solutions. Everybody wants to be solution oriented. But I think sometimes it, it causes us to not think clearly and deeply about the problem. And with Namibia, they looked at local people immediately, not as part of the problem, but actually as part of the solution. And they saw poaching not as the problem, but actually as a consequence of a much deeper problem that actually lied in the, the support of the local people, and that poaching had actually become a norm. It was a normal behavior. It was something that no one saw any problem with. So how are we going to stop that when something um, as difficult to police and control has become a normal situation? So in 1983, these two individuals, Rudy and Blythe Luti, um, decided that they wanted to do something about the poaching. They were seeing dead rhinos on their doorstep, and they knew something needed to be done. And they wanted to try and figure out how can we work with local people? How can we empower and engage with them in a way that creates a positive attitude for Ryan? And these are some of the early guys that they first started um, working with. Um, basically, to get them out into the field, patrolling, monitoring the rhinos, getting to know them. And their approach was really um, quite simple, but very effective. And over the years, they've, they've employed about 80 local people um, to join their force and to, rather than uh, poach rhinos, actually help protect them. Through this, all this effort and all this knowledge, they've managed to create one of the largest and longest running databases on any rhino population in the entire world. And we use this database now to help us make a lot of decisions. Um, more recently, about 10, 15 years ago, we started getting into tourism and seeing how we could take this knowledge and create a new experience for tourists who are wanting to come and see rhinos and use this money to help pay for the monitoring work. Um, and through all this effort, we've seen our population in northwestern Namibia more than quintuple, while a lot of other populations were continuously on the downward slide. But before I talk more in detail, I have to mention a few things that definitely do make Namibia unique. Um, it has a very, very low human population density, one of, the, one of the lowest in the world. And as I mentioned before, with 68,000 people in half the state of Minnesota, very few people tend to create lesser problems. So we definitely have that going for us. 
Namibia has built, uh, because it's a young country, its independence was in 1990, they were able to actually build habitat conservation into their constitution, um, which is one of the only countries in the world uh, to actually have that. So there's a legal um, emphasis on protecting nature um, and natural resources. And as I mentioned, they fully embraced uh, nature-based tourism, which now is the second leading um, contributor to economic development in the country. Yeah. yeah. So what's being done beyond policing? Um, I mean, obviously the, the real reason this is happening is for medicinal purposes. So what's being done to bring in better medical care, you know, just from a human standpoint, so that we're actually enjoying some of the benefits we, we have? In, in Asia? Yeah. Well, the, the traditional Chinese community has been working very hard on creating a lot of um, uh, substitutes and they found synthetic materials to be just as effective uh, in many cases um, as the natural products. Um, Western medicine is, is slowly but surely becoming much more prevalent in, in Asia. In fact, I, I still go to China usually once, once a year and a lot of my close friends in China um, often and then almost always use, use Western medicine. And, and although I haven't personally been to a hospital in China, I would suspect most of them are, are probably pretty, pretty decent. But the problem is when you're dealing with a terminal illness, um, often people will say that they will go and try Western medicine first. If it doesn't help, somebody's always heard of somebody who tried something and, and it seemed to possibly work um, with something like Rhinoma. So. Um, I think that is sort of still in the back of people's minds, and, and it's it's still a still an issue. Yep. Yeah. Backing on that question, is there any, is Rhino Horn ever shown any demonstrated efficacy against anything? Has no. anybody done any double-blind placebo studies with it? The the trials that I have read about have been very. There's been really no difference in, in any of the the rats that were tested. Um, However, for somebody who practices in Eastern medicine, the Western scientific method doesn't equate anywhere anyway. So they just blow these things off as well. That's, that's your science. That's fine. You can keep it. All right. So uh, back to Namibia. Um, my role in, in this whole thing from pretty much day one when I arrived in 2003 was to work with Save the Rhino Trust uh, and provide science leadership. Um, often you find local organizations with a ton of, of local knowledge and, and skills, but they lack a bit of technical expertise. So I was able to bring that to the table. A lot of my work is trying to take that knowledge that I spoke about, that the local people have, and that they've collected over the years, and put it into useful tools to help make better decisions. So this is an example of, of maps. I do a lot of, of mapping work. Um, this is Rhino Habitat. You can see these three guys are, are there discussing a, a new park that they were uh, thinking about creating a few years ago. This is actually the governor of the region. Um, and we've also been working on new databases to better manage our patrol data, um, informational cards for the trackers to better keep track of or better identify the rhinos using earmarks and horn shape. So these are just some of the things that I've been doing um, to help further the science work uh, that Save the Rhino Trust has been busy doing. But when I first arrived, I also noticed something uh, very interesting. And this, this was actually a photo from the first workshop that I attended under a tree, as most of the meetings are. And what was very interesting to me was that what was being discussed and being debated had a lot more to do with with local values. And, and, and all of these people had come from some hundreds of miles away on their donkey carts, um, some if they were lucky on a bicycle. They were all very supportive about receiving rhinos back on their land. And this was a new project that the government was also initiating to try and expand the population. So we were out discussing with the local people how they felt about this idea. And it was very clear to me at that point that science alone was not going to be enough uh, to help secure these rhinos. We really need to, we really needed to understand what is it about the rhinos that, that the local people valued and saw potential value in and how can we capitalize on that to secure future. 
And it was, it's really fundamentally about trying to balance this, this carrot and, and, and stick, right? So, so the military style approach is really just focus on the stick. They're trying to keep you honest, keep you from committing illegal crimes. But there's, there's nothing sort of positive out there to try and encourage you to do the right thing. And, and these are some of the things that we were really trying to look for. How can we, how can we create uh, an environment where local people saw more value in keeping rhinos alive than dead? So, as I mentioned, the government had created this very interesting program called the Rhino Custodianship Program, where even though all the black rhinos in Namibia are state-owned, they were willing to share some of the governance or decision-making rights and benefit rights with local communities that were willing to sign on as rhino custodians. And the, the point behind this was that the government knew they didn't have enough money or manpower to, to look after these rhinos. They knew the communities were out there um, and were interested, but how can we engage them in a positive way um, to try and promote not only just a partnership, but also this sort of shared uh, model of, of improving the value of rhino. So I just want to show you a real quick video. This is a picture actually of a rhino that is being immobilized to now move into a new community as we're expanding the, the range of the population and put them into areas that had been uh, previously poached out. So just another short clip here. That was just a clip from a documentary called Milking the Rhino, which is, uh, I'd highly recommend if anyone's interested in, in seeing a, a great video uh, that, that documents the community-based approaches uh, between Namibia and Kenya. I think you can download it off the internet. But, okay. Yeah. When you move an animal, these are typically solitary animals, right? Yeah. So there's not a problem with breaking up a family or anything like that. Um, well, you you will find mothers with their with their calves. So we, we don't move uh, mothers yeah. with calves, but but you bring up a very interesting point. And one of the um, another uh, rhino scientist from Zimbabwe actually found out that rhinos do have a communication sort of network. And they do tend to stay in groups. They're not physically together all the time, but they communicate amongst each other and they become used to each other. And what they found was that when they would move groups of rhinos into new areas, there was a much higher survival rate and a much higher um, likelihood of those rhinos actually settling down and staying in that place versus just moving different individuals that didn't know each other. Often you get fights with males. With the new territory. Yeah, yeah. So, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so, this work that you just saw demonstrated um, has been carried out now. It started in about 2005, and almost 40 rhinos were actually moved, um, some by truck, some by airplane. This is actually a special pallet, they call it the rhino pallet, <laughs> that was developed to airlift rhinos out of the mountains, which most of our area is actually uh, very rugged mountains, out of there into, into uh, new places. Uh, we're able to uh, reestablish populations in 13 communities across the whole region, which was a huge success. In fact, it was so successful that while this was happening, the poaching rates, if you remember that earlier graph that I showed you, poaching rates were also starting to increase ex exponentially in neighboring South Africa. So this was a big concern with us. While the ministry is moving all these rhinos out to these communities, uh, we knew, we meaning Save the Rhino Trust, that there's no way that we had enough people to actually adequately protect these rhinos. So we started asking questions. Do we need to start now hiring more people to do this work? Or is there another way that we can uh, achieve you know, the effective rhino monitoring that we need without having to do that and be more sustainable? So we tried to figure out how can we leverage resources from, from partner organizations uh, to make this happen. So in 2009, um, we joined forces with the Nature Conservancy's Africa program. The Minnesota Zoo came on board. And together, we started to come up with uh, a new plan that would actually look towards building capacity in the local communities, building up these local teams of rangers that were selected and accountable to their community to do this work, rather than sending in NGO-based teams working for Save the Rhino Trust um, to do the monitoring work. And it was really about trying to create this, again, attitude that these are your rhinos out here, guys. The, the, the government has basically granted you these rights to have these rhinos and to benefit from them. Um, 
Let's start protecting them. And you can see just across the range, these are all the communities that received rhinos. This is pretty much the area that, that we were effectively monitoring to save the rhino trust. So we really had to work hard to get out here and get these local teams established and trained. And the first thing that we did uh, was try and pull together some of the, the, the most experienced trackers and, and trainers from the region. So we created a, a support group, the Rhino Ranger support group, um, which is basically myself and three team leaders from both Save the Rhino Trust and another organization. And our, and our mission was to try and get out, get the guys trained, engage with the communities on a face-to-face on -face level, explain to them this new responsibility that they have, and to try and get them uh, to, to participate in this program, select guys, and allow us to come in and help uh, build that capacity. So, uh, interestingly enough, the first year we were hoping to get two or three communities on board, but as soon as the word got out, everybody wanted to join the program. So we tried to <laughs> quick ramp up our work, and before we knew it, we had about 18 new rangers across nine communities that were sitting on our doorstep, uh, ready to get training and equipment. So uh, the first the first work in this in this effort was really about incentivizing them by providing this new training, getting them uniforms, nice nice uniforms with new logos to make them feel good, um, identify with a, with a very unique thing, get them some some new equipment um, that they can learn how to use. This is a picture of the guys using these ultra ultra zoom um, cameras, which didn't go very well at first, but um, they learn very quickly how to use some of these things. And I always like to tell this story because I think oftentimes when you when you discuss this with people who've worked with that in Africa, they say, ah, oh, yeah, those those guys are going to really struggle with a lot of that equipment. You know, technology is 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 a challenge for these guys that, that live out in the sticks. You know, and initially, certainly it is. These are two guys from one of the communities on one of their first patrols. And what happened was, um, Boss, one of our other team leaders, was out. They were, they were tracking a rhino. They found it. They were approaching it. And just as he was about ready to hand over the camera for these guys to take their photograph, they were gone. He couldn't find them anywhere. He had to backtrack about two or 300 yards, and he found them hiding in this little ravine. <coughs> Excuse me. They said, Boss, there's, there's no way. Man, you're crazy. You, know, you get that close to those rhinos. We're, we're, we're not sure if this is what we want to do. About two days later, they took this photo. Um, so they just need a little bit of a little bit of patience, a little bit of soft pushing, and they can produce some pretty amazing results. This is another photograph that one of the teams recently took of a rhino that hasn't been seen for over five years. So not only are they taking good photographs, they're actually taking photographs of a rhino that are extremely difficult to find. So they're really uh, doing a fantastic job uh, with their work. What we've been busy with uh, more recently this year is now that they're busy collecting all this information, we want to try and get them reporting uh, more information back to their community. We want to try and, and, and um, reduce that gap to try and raise more interest and awareness among the communities that these guys are supposed to be working for. So we created these rhino log books, which, which basically is just a calendar with all the rhino names on it. So every time the guys see one of their rhino in their area, they just make a, ch a check mark in that month on the box so that the community um, knows that, okay, uh, Tim was seen this month and, 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 and Joe was seen the last two months, but, but Sally hasn't been seen for three months. Um, what's going on with Sally? This is where we can come in and help out um, and we can maybe sound an alert if there's a missing rhino. Uh, but this is, again, empowering the community to know about their rhinos. The last few years we've also expanded again all the way up to the 13 communities that originally received rhinos. So we're looking at, at 26 guys that are busy every single month out on patrol uh, working with uh, both Save the Rhino Trust as well as uh, some of the other teams, uh, continuously learning sort of on the job. And what we've managed to do over the past couple of years, I'm, I'm very, very excited uh, and proud about. You can see in 2011, there was virtually zero community-led uh, rhino patrols taking place. And over the past few years, you can see this very nice trend um, to where uh, just last year, we had over 1,000 days out in the field and almost 800 rhino sightings. 
that were all led by these community teams. What does this actually mean or what has this actually done for, for poaching is kind of another question. The guys can go out, they can do their work, but is it actually reducing poaching? Well, what I can report on is that in these community areas, there's over half of the free-ranging rhino in our area, but less than 20% of the rhinos that have been poached has taken place out here. So only four rhinos over the past 20-some years have actually been poached out in these community lands, which I think is, is pretty impressive. And more interestingly is that not a single rhino has been poached in an area where we have been conducting uh, rhino tourism. And that's something I uh, will talk about in a minute as well. One of the other big uh, improvements, yeah, sorry. Did the government of Namibia also sell that tag for Corey Dalton, though? So are they promoting the rhino tourism and the trophy hunting? Yep. A lot of countries actually do that. There's, I think, most of the East African countries do not allow any hunting, and Botswana now and Zambia, I believe, have been hunting. But quite a few African countries do combine the two. Often it's not done in the same locations. We, we don't do any hunting of, of rhino in our area. And we focus mainly on promoting the tourism aspects of, of conserving rhinos. And interestingly enough, even the local people that I've talked to about hunting of rhinos, they don't want anything to do with it. They also don't understand why we would want to shoot rhinos that we're trying to save. So there's been no interest and, and no push to, to, to hunt any rhinos in, in northwestern India. Will that change? I mean, will the government see what you're doing and then say we no longer have to sell these tags? I thought part of the way they were promoting it was to say we're going to shoot these male rhinos that can't uh, reproduce anymore and that are causing problems with the younger rhinos. Right, right. That's one of the arguments that, that is put out there to try and justify the, the hunt. Um, yeah, the, the, the tricky thing is that we don't get involved um, in any of those decisions. We're not at the table. We didn't even hear about the trophy hunt until after it came out in social media. Um, so, yeah, we're not sure what the future will bring. What I do know is that, you know, the government has seen all of the postings. They've, they're aware of the issues that it has caused. And because tourism is so important to the country, you know, there, there might be future decisions that, that may not include hunting. I, I, I couldn't tell you. It's, it's a bit out of my, my realm. Yep. Talking about rhino, we can hunt. You mentioned the street value of the horn can be a quarter million dollars. Uh, the field value of taking local value is obviously much less than that I and mean, it's just like drugs. Is is rhino tourism competing on a dollar for dollar basis with the value of horn at the source level? Um absolutely not. <laughs> I mean I, I think when we when we look at um, trying to compete dollar for dollar with the with the black market, you will you will never probably get even close to that. And I think what, what we're trying to create is is a critical mass of people that see more value, not necessarily monetary value, but more value overall in, in, in keeping rhinos alive. So for example, in, in our area, pretty much everybody that, that I know knows somebody or has family members that are involved in tourism. They know that poaching can have a very negative impact on tourism um, and their family members might, might be affected. Um, a lot of the, the breadwinners from families are, are involved in tourism. Um, so they, they, they do sort of see a longer view, you know, regards to, to the poaching issue. And they're not necessarily looking at that, that, that little short-term buck that, that, that they could make. And, and I think often people also, that, you know, that, that, that thing goes, that, that thought process does go through their mind, um, you know, that okay, I might be able to get away with poaching a rhino, but because I know there's quite a few people in my village that are very supportive of rhinos, there's a darn good chance that I might get caught. And it's sort of this check and balance that, that I think keeps, keeps people honest. But, you know, the, the, average, the average annual income in northwestern Namibia is less than $1,000 a year. 
Now, the evidence that we have is that poachers, that middlemen, will offer three times that amount um, for a set of horns. So if it's dollar for dollar, I, I don't think we will ever compete with it. Yeah? When you um, cited that there were 800 rhinos um, um, that were cited, how, how are they identified and how do you know that they're seen individual rhinos in that? Right. So, so I, I have the, the wonderful job of going through every one of their photos. <laughs> so I, um, I've built different uh, tools and databases that help me figure out who is who based on ear marks, horn shape, um, all this stuff. So the 800 rhino sightings are, are some of them are the same rhino, um, not all different rhinos. Um, but I can tell you that on average the teams usually see between 70 and 80 percent of the rhinos in their areas on, on their patrols. And we're actually trying to create some new uh, uh, actually money bonus systems to give them even extra bonuses for finding greater uh, percentages of the rhinos in their area. I mean, currently, they do get a bonus for every rhino sighting that they get, which is actually just a cash payout. They have to complete an ID form and they have to take a decent photograph. But we want to try and continue creating new incentives for them to not just see more rhinos, but see more different rhinos. Um, and we do the same thing with the guys that are working uh, with the tourism that I'm going to talk about in just a second here. So I just wanted to mention um, one of the other big things that, that we've focused on this year is, is closing this gap between our work and law enforcement. And as I mentioned before, law enforcement has its uh, downsides in terms of, of some of the negative impacts that it has on local communities. But I don't think anyone would ever say that we shouldn't have law enforcement um, to help save rhinos. It's absolutely critical. But it's connecting that law enforcement to communities, um, building that trust that I think is absolutely critical because there's a lot of information, there's a lot of good grace in the local community that can help law enforcement do their job better. And currently, we're seeing some great things. We're, we're uh, having policemen now, local policemen, join us on all our patrols. So the one nice thing is that they're armed. Um, in case we do, our teams do come in contact with, with poachers. At least there's a bit of self-defense that can work out. Um, but these guys are now actually starting to see the value that our trackers are bringing to the table. This is, this is one of our community members and a policeman who found a bunch of snares together. And I've, I've been told that um, it was Tenzi who was able to actually track uh, the human footprints into some some uh, some areas where they knew there was some some funny activity and actually led the policemen to do all these things. So again, it's it's this um, this cost share of knowledge basically, um, and, and this exchange of of, of of usefulness that is building up some great relations. And proof of concept happened this year in June, and I'm, I'm actually very proud to announce that. Um, even while three, Africa, uh, three rhinos a day are still being poached across Africa, we've only lost one rhino this year um, in our area. And even that one rhino has a silver lining to it because while our teams were out on patrol, they managed to come across a human footprint while they were tracking the female that they knew was in this area. They then noticed that the rhino was running. Now this is all traditional knowledge, so they can tell by the way, the rhinos, the, the length, um, expert trackers. So um, then they found some blood on a branch, and immediately they thought something's not right here. So one of the guys actually hiked up a mountain with his cell phone and had the, the wherewithal to phone back to our base camp and alert our director to alert the police that, excuse me, um, there might be something happening here and that we need help. Within a couple of hours, the police were able to block all of the exits out of the area. And later that day, they managed to pull over a pickup truck uh, with license plates from an outside area. They found the rifle in the hood, underneath the hood of the car. They found the horns, which were freshly cut off, put underneath the spare tire. And they were able to arrest these three guys, basically caught uh, red-handed. All because we had guys out in the field who not only could track rhino and could interpret uh, a risky situation, but were able to phone and had that partnership uh, with the local police. But as I also mentioned, uh, we're looking towards um, increasing those benefits back to communities. And one of our most hopeful mechanisms 
uh, is through tourism. While we worked very hard the first couple of years to train our community teams on just finding rhino and monitoring them, we're now moving into our next phase, which is teaching them how to work with tourists, which is a whole different ballgame. And now fortunately we've got about 10 years of experience doing this at a, a partner camp that we established back in 2003 with Wilderness Safaris, um, whereby Save the Rhino Trust provide a tracking service um, for their activities that they lead with the guide, they bring in the guests, it's a very high-end camp, um, and part of the money that the guests are paying goes to support an entire Save the Rhino Trust team that's based at the camp, um, as well as an additional 10% of the revenues that go back to the neighboring uh, three communities that have actually entered into now a legal contract with wilderness safaris for the use of, of, of their land. And this is a picture now that just shows a handful of our local guys sitting in on what is um, actually a, an engagement uh, lunchtime sort of classroom, as we call it. One of our lead trackers here, Martin, is, is talking to the guests here about his work, about the rhinos in the area, about Save the Rhino Trust. Um, and, and these guys are now learning uh, a bit about what tourists are interested in, um, and what sort of their story can provide uh, to increase the uh, to increase the experience uh, for the guests. So we're busy to try and not only again cultivate this this local value for Rhino, but also create awareness internationally. We have a lot of guests that come through northern Namibia every year, and we want to try and get the message out, try and get more people to come to Namibia to help save Rhinos by actually coming out and seeing them uh, with us on a safari. And earlier this year, we had some positive results from our first community-led rhino tracking activity. So this is a group of guests with one of our community trackers. You can see we started there in October uh, last year. Tourist bookings and rhino sightings, they didn't really get above about 10, 10 or 12 until a few months ago, when all of a sudden, uh, the word evidently got out that this is a pretty solid experience and um, significantly now has shot up over the past few months, where we're basically getting almost 100 guests now a month and about 50 or 60 rhino sightings that we didn't have before. Um, this, these, this one uh, team from the local community has earned a couple thousand US dollars now on benefits back to their community for this activity through the partnership that we've helped uh, negotiate uh, with the local tourism operator and it's actually protecting about 15% of the region's rhino, just this, this one activity. So this is, again, very helpful, helpful for not only us to see that this can work, but now also all these other teams are seeing how these guys work, how they're earning income, how they're getting out and seeing more rhinos. And, and we've been now, I think, just before I came here, we got two requests from two new communities to come out and also help train them, get them up and running, and establish uh, their own rhino tracking. Um, activity. So this is pretty much what we're up to next. What I'm going to be busy with for the for the rest of the year, I'm going to be up in this community, Puros, on the northern end, end of the range, and down in Doronavas, also training those teams with some of my partners on conducting um, rhino conservation tourism. If we can achieve this, we'll basically be looking at about half of our teams now that are fully supported for rhino tourism, um, and hopefully we can get the rest of the teams up over the next few years. In addition to this work with the tourism, um, we're also looking to try and expand some of our work by getting some of the, some of the youth involved. Um, it's one thing that we know is really important and we just haven't quite had time uh, to do that yet, uh, but we're looking at uh, developing some potential things with, with education um, and also getting the Rhino Rangers, the community teams that are out busy looking after the rhinos to be sort of that conduit back to the community, um, to be that messenger uh, to sit with uh, the local kids to talk about their work and get them again excited about the rhino. And I wanted to show um, one more video that kind of uh, demonstrates again all of the stuff that I've been talking about in action. So this is just another very short film that demonstrates sort of Save the Rhino Trust work out in the field and links in some of the tourism Alright, well, sorry about that. Um, as you can see, looking after rhinos is not uh, always a safe um, activity. <laughs> um, this is one of Save the Rhino Trust tracking teams that is out. Uh, 
um, every month on the ground looking at Rhino. And, and basically the rest of the video um, just sort of showed a very brief introduction to Desert Rhino Camp that I had mentioned, where we bring in guests to uh, go out with our tracking teams um, and to see the rhinos. But rather than see the video, much better just to come to Namibia and see it for yourself. So what's the best time here? Where do you find October. Currently, there's there's only two other uh, operators that do rhino tracking in our area. One is the Fruitberg Lodge, which I can I can give you that information later, and the other one is the Pollenbach Lodge, which is the activity that I mentioned before with our local tracking team. And you can book all that stuff online. If you probably just Google rhino tracking in Namibia, um, that stuff will will come up. But I'd be happy to tell you more about it. So to bring it home a little bit, this whole idea of improving law enforcement by creating you know, a social foundation that you know, is able to rally around something that they value. I came across this article actually just the other day, which, which struck me as being fairly interesting. I, I'm sure you guys are, are aware of all this uh, police protesting that's been happening. I've been trying to follow a little bit uh, from afar. Uh, but there's an interesting article about a um, police chief out in California who seemed to be addressing the issue in a, in a very similar way that we in Namibia are addressing uh, the, the, the poaching problem. And uh, he sort of summed it up in a, in a great video, uh, very short again, but uh, hopefully this one <laughs> uh, works, uh, the whole thing. But I'll let him um, introduce. So I thought that was uh, kind of an interesting connection with uh, the fundamental aspects of, of really how we're trying to address the problem in the media by rather defining it as poaching and fighting poaching with, with military approaches is to rather see this idea that to, to really help decrease or combat the poaching, we need to create a social environment that has value for Rhino. And only when we have that social foundation, that, that unity, that cohesion, that can rally around Rhino, um, are we going to really get to a point where law enforcement can be effective. And I just wanted to come back to this picture, uh, not, not because I don't have other pictures, but I think it, it just really shows um, a really positive trend that, that um, I'm very proud about with, with our work in Namibia, um, which is trying to create local heroes again out of, out of these guys. Um, and this is totally juxtaposed to what's currently happening, for example, in Mozambique, where the local heroes are the poachers. These are the guys that are killing rhinos, but when they come back to the community, they're bringing the horns, they're bringing money. Everyone knows who the guys are. They have the big houses, the fancy cars. Um, and these are the guys um, that have helped create this normal behavior, this idea that poaching is perfectly normal and accepted locally. We want poaching to be seen as a, as a crime against the community. You know, these, these rhino are providing benefits and values back to the broader community, and that, that is at stake when, when a rhino gets poached. And as we slowly, I think, get to this integration, um, I think, or I hope that um, a lot of the work that we're doing there, um, not everything, because every single um, rhino population exists within its own social and, and political context. And I think when we look at the broader picture, when we step back and we look at all of the different strategies that are available to us and that other people are trying, there certainly is not going to be one silver bullet solution. And, and most people also agree that we need to have a mix of, of different strategies um, as, our, as, our, uh, as our overall solution. But I think that the fundamental principles of, of engaging local people, getting that support locally for, um, for not just rhino, but any endangered species, if you want to protect it, is absolutely critical uh, if we want to create lasting success for, for the world's endangered species. So, um, as you saw from the video, the guys are working hard, they're getting chased often by rhinos. Um, you know, everything is not always peachy for us in Namibia too, just like the officer said. 
Success is, is, is sometimes, but we're also fighting up, uphill battles. We constantly need help and assistance. Um, I didn't talk much about uh, the, the issues that we are dealing with also in Namibia with our population. And this is just a graph that shows the, the birth rates here in blue, uh, sorry, green, uh, over time, and the, 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 the death rates uh, below this line. So you can see these yellow bars are actually natural deaths, and these red bars are poach grinders. The past three years, um, it's pretty obvious that our population is, is not growing. In fact, it also is decreasing. But what's interesting here, this black line is the rainfall. So you can see we're sitting at the end of a three-year drought. And ironically, now, the drought is a bigger worry for us than the poaching. However, with the drought comes the simple fact that every rhino that we lose to poaching becomes that much more of a problem. So our population is also sitting at a very precarious um, a point um, at the moment. And, and we're really hoping, again, that I mentioned this year, we've only lost one rhino. I know we've had seven new rhino calves being born. So I hope that, that will, this graph might look a little bit different um, at the end of this year. But we also have things like this image to remind us sort of where rhinos are sitting uh, in the bigger picture. I, I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, this is a, a guy by the name of Sudan. He is the last male surviving northern white rhino. The last male white rhino. There are four females currently that are existing um, in the wild. And if this guy doesn't do some breeding very soon, this will be the end of, of this, this subspecies. Uh, thankfully, there's quite a few southern white rhinos still in existence in, in southern Africa, but um, I think this image is very striking because it, it demonstrates the length of, of effort that people are willing to try and go through uh, to protect rhinos. I think it demonstrates sort of the brutality of, of, of poaching and what these rhinos are up against, but I think he actually kind of has a, a pretty sad looking face there. Um, and. You know, we, we really hope that this is not the future um, for rhinos. And we sit with a um, similar situation, like I said, in Namibia. Some of you may have heard of, about a few years ago, uh, Minnesota adopted its, its own rhino. This is a, a baby rhino that we've named Soda. Uh, this was back in 2009, so he's now about uh, six years old. But this is a, a very recent picture of Soda. So he's also been dehorned, he's been ear notched. Um, and is his future secure? It's, it's up in the air at the moment. Um, it really truly is. Although we feel like we are on a good path, we feel like we're doing everything we can to make sure that Soda does uh, make it into the future um, and does not end up the last male of the black rhino. <laughs> And I started with sort of a bit of a personal story. Um, I just want to end with one. Uh, this is my wife. Um, outside of our house at Burl's End. Um, this is our, our two-year-old son. And I've lived there for 13 years. Uh, you know, this is, not, uh, this is not a backyard science project for me. This is not something I sort of do, do in the evenings. Um, and when you, when you live out in the field doing conservation work, it, it just becomes your life. Um, there's, as, as my boss will tell you, I normally don't even know what day of the week it is. So I don't show up all that time on the, the Skype calls for staff meetings. Um, but this is something that I have made a commitment to. My wife actually works for the other big uh, community conservation organization that works in the area. And we have completely committed everything that we have um, to living and working in, in, in this amazing landscape. And I'm just very thankful for the great support that I get from, from Minnesota, for the Minnesota Zoo. Um, as you all know, we don't have rhinos at the Minnesota Zoo, so it's, I think, very unique um, that the Minnesota Zoo has chosen to support this, uh, this project in Namibia. Um, and it, it, makes, it makes me very proud every time I come back and can report that um, we are holding the line in Namibia. Namibia. Um, thank you very much again for coming out tonight. I did want to mention one other thing. If you wanted to support our program, we have these wonderful little uh, necklaces out front that are all very unique. I 
uh, handmade by a friend of mine in Namibia, a local artist. Um, and the proceeds are going to go back to our rhino program in Namibia. So you can see, uh, some of you maybe saw it out on the table out there. Um, thank you very much. Jeff will be here as long as folks want to be uh, here asking him things. I also did want to mention our next speaker series event on October 10th. Uh, we're going to have our very own uh, Dr. Eric Rundquist and Tony Fisher here talking about the Minnesota Zoo's work in prairies of Minnesota. And so we're going to hear about the prairie butterfly work and the bison release that just happened in Minneopa State Park. And it's also going to be associated with um, an adult's evening here at the Minnesota Zoo. So you can come early, and the zoo will be open. You can see the animals and come and check out the speaker series as well. So thank you again for being here tonight, and please feel free to come down and talk to Jeff. <laughs>